grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Wake up! <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't mean to scare you or ruin anyone's chance for a nice little nap. I just thought I would say what we heard Paul say to the believers in Rome in our second lesson for today. And what Paul said was, wake up! Actually, what Paul was saying was that it was time to wake up. The night is far gone. The day is near, Paul said. And the day Paul meant was the day of salvation. But by that, Paul didn't mean the end of the world. What he meant was the coming of the new age inaugurated in the resurrection of Christ. It's the coming of the kingdom of God, the redemption of God's creation, God working a new creation, a new heaven, and earth. And so the night, the darkness of the old world, was given away to morning, the light of a new world. That was the end Paul was talking about. The end of the present age with all its chaos and confusion and death, and the beginning of the new age in which God would put all things right and creation would be what it was meant to be. So it was time to wake up to what God was doing. And not only to wake up, but also get dressed. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said. In other words, it was time to live differently. The believers were to live not by the standards of the old world that was passing away, but by the standards of the new world that was breaking in. They were to clothe themselves with Christ, and above all, that meant mutual love, the love that gave itself for the sake of the neighbor, and a uh, fellow world. They were to put aside the old garments of jealousy and quarreling, anger and bitterness, the self-destructive behaviors that sought only personal pleasure with no regard for the other. They were to live as if the kingdom had already come. And right now was the moment to begin, Paul said, because you just never know. That was what Paul was really saying. God might usher in his kingdom at any moment, and Paul wanted his hearers to be ready for it and to be part of it by living now as kingdom people. You could also say that for Paul, because of what was begun in the resurrection of Christ, every moment was the moment of ultimate salvation. In every moment, something of the kingdom could break in. And so he said, wake up. And you and I, do we need to wake up? Clearly Paul believed that many Christians in Rome were living as if they were asleep. Asleep to the urgency of the moment, asleep to what God was doing and what they were to be doing, asleep to life itself. And asleep too in the sense that they thought they could continue to live by the standards of the world without consequence. Asleep to what was at stake. They thought they had forever to lounge in their PJs, still asleep to the fact that morning had broken, and it was time to get up and put on the clothes of Christ that Christ had laid out for them. And do we live as if we are asleep? What do you think? Is it time for us to wake up? But wake up to what? Well, I have an idea or two about that. Some 57 or 58 years ago, when my wife Kitty and I were dating, we attended her church one Sunday morning, and in the sermon for the day, the pastor said something that woke me up good, and which I have never forgotten. What he said was simply this, whoever guaranteed you tomorrow? I was 19 or 20 at the time, and sat there daydreaming about life to come. Figuring hey, I had a million years ahead of me. Figuring Kitty and I had a million years, a million tomorrows. And then the preacher said, whoever guaranteed you tomorrow? And maybe that's one thing most all of us need to wake up to. We just never know. Not only never know when God might usher in his kingdom, but also never know how many days we have. The truth the preacher spoke was the truth that God doesn't guarantee us tomorrow. Neither does our goodness guarantee us tomorrow, 
nor a healthy diet or exercise. Nothing we do can guarantee us tomorrow. And when at last we live by this truth, it can make a big difference in our days. In Thornton Longest play in our town, there's a very moving passage, a passage I return to again and again. A young girl who died is given the chance to return to her life and relive one day. When she does, she realizes that no one really notices. Notice all, all there is in a day, not even notice each other. They go through their days as if they are blind, asleep. Finally, it is all too much for her, and she says, I can't. I can't go on. Oh, oh, it goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. I didn't realize. So all that was going on, and we never noticed. Take me back, up the hill, to my grave. But first, wait. One more look. Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corner. Mama and Papa. Goodbye, the clock's ticking. And Mama's sunflowers. And food and coffee. And new iron dresses and hot baths. And sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. Do any human beings ever realize life when they live it? Every, every minute. And how much do we miss, fail to notice, in our busyness or anger or boredom or bitterness or nonstop pursuit of success or pleasure or entertainment? So many people today seem to constantly have their heads down, looking at their cell phones or iPads, checking the latest texts and tweets and posts on Facebook, watching YouTube videos or even movies, staring at those screens, not even looking up when they're out to dinner or walking along or seated right in front of me, oblivious to the world around them, not noticing at all. How much do they miss? How much of life do all of us miss? One thing about being a grandparent is that you realize how much you miss as a parent. So busy with working, getting ahead, so busy raising kids, running them here and there, tending to their needs, busy with your own needs too, and the schedules. No time to breathe, no time to stop, no time to really look at one another, to notice. Do we ever realize life while we live it? Or do we say, tomorrow, tomorrow? thinking we will always have tomorrow. Some of you may remember Emma's rules, or more accurately, Dopey's rules, because that's the name my granddaughter Emma gave me when she first learned to talk, Dopey. And Dopey's rules are the rules I established for Emma to guide her, and they came to guide Sydney and Ethan too. The first rule still remains, no whining. But as Emma and Sydney and Ethan grew older, I decided to work with them on taking that rule to the next step. What I call moving from griping to gratitude. Our grandchildren had wonderful, loving parents, lived in beautiful homes, and had their own rooms stuffed with everything they could ever want, attended excellent schools, and had opportunities galore ahead of them. But still, they were always griping about something. But then they weren't good company. Griping is our national pastime. You rarely encounter gratitude in anyone these days, and the strange thing is that those who are the most well-off seem to be the least grateful. Actually, it's nearly everyone. Everywhere you, everywhere you turn, you hear someone griping about what's wrong, hardly ever giving thanks for what's right. If people actually do say they're thankful, it's usually only after they spend 30 to 40 minutes griping. Finally saying, now don't get me wrong, I really am very thankful. Right. What I was trying to teach our grandchildren early in life was what many adults have never learned. To start with gratefulness. To be grateful just for the day, for whatever you have, for life itself. Because gratitude helps us notice, live with hope, and treat each day as the gift it is. 
You just never know. So now is the moment. Today is the day to wake up. Of course, Paul was after far more than that. We're to wake up to the fact that we don't have forever to start living as Christ calls us to live as his followers and thus be part of the kingdom. Now is the time. Today is the day to put on Christ. Really, each morning is the time to put on Christ. Every morning, we need to remember how we are to be and intentionally choose to wear Christ into the day and throughout the day. The mutual love we are to show, the kindness and compassion we are to adopt, the forgetting of self we are to exemplify, the self-destructive behaviors and the angers and bitterness we are to put off, the hope we are to wrap around ourselves. You know, it's what we see in every natural disaster. People being what people can be at their best. People being human, one to the other. Neighbor being neighbor, race and politics and economic class not matter. Only the need to help and rescue and save matter. The sadness, of course, is that it doesn't last. People seem to soon retreat into themselves again revert to the old behaviors, reclothe themselves with the fears and prejudices and opinions that so divide and hurt us. If it is the last, then we must put on Christ, not just in times of crisis, but each and every morning, and be a model of what we can be at our best. In other words, every morning, we must seek to be kingdom people, people who work to build up life and hope and what is good by overcoming differences with others, working together in spite of those differences, seeking what God seeks for creation, and being people whom God recognizes as kingdom people. Because you just never know. Of course, none of this may apply to you. You may not need me to act as your personal alarm clock. So here at the end, I'll simply say what I say to myself every day of my life. Jeff, wake up. Amen. Amen.